thank you. It's always a bit disconcerting to see your full face up there. It's a bit, a bit large and worrisome. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for turning up today. And thank you, especially to the Neurological Foundation for offering me the opportunity to do this. There are a few people in the room that know me. And what they know is that I love talking about this stuff. So, you know, if I'm starting to go on into your bedtime, just, just wave at me and let me know. I'm gonna talk a little bit about being lost in space. Which way is it to the city? It's a little test for you to start with. I want you to point where the city center of Tauranga is. Oh, we've got it all over the place. Over there, over there, back here, fabulous. The operations that are going on in your brain whilst you're thinking about that and whilst you're trying to work it out are what we call spatial navigation skills. They're skills of spatial memory. Can I orientate myself in space? Do I know where things are relative to each other? And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit tonight. I've been really lucky to be funded in part by the Neurological Foundation, and that means funded by donations from people like yourselves. So I am hugely grateful um, for that, and I've enjoyed spending your money, so thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about myself, though, because you heard all the boring stuff. But I'm a physiotherapist and a neuroscientist, and I think those two things go really well together. I like understanding how the brain works and how to then make interventions that deal with the problems that patients truly have. I like to make an impact to, on the patients. I'm an ex-gymnast, I have to say very ex, decades ex, um, but I still like doing the odd cartwheel or two. I am a fencer, so I also like wielding a sword so if anybody would like to have a little play on the piece afterwards, I'm all up for it. Uh, I have a very patient partner, an extremely energetic 12-year-old son, and a forever hungry dog. We have to keep away from the kitchen. Of course, he's a Labrador. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the really important people, though. I work with a fabulous team of people, a team of people that are therapists, engineers, computational scientists, other sorts of neuroscientists, and they all really help us to bring our work together. I also work with very insightful patients, and it truly has been the patients that have given me the hard questions. They always say the things that we don't quite understand. And most of the time when we don't understand them as clinicians, we go, ooh. I don't want to hear that because I can't make sense of it. And one of the things I'm really interested in is making sense of those things that at this point in time we don't understand. Patients and clients really keep you honest as a researcher. They keep you doing the things that really matter. So getting on to what I'm talking about, we've probably all been in this situation. Lost, not knowing quite where we are. Now, has anybody ever been lost? Yeah, yeah, everybody, right? It's not unusual to be lost. And so don't start panicking that you're all suffering with some dreadful neurological condition if you've been lost. It's usual to get lost. What's less usual is to get lost in familiar places, places that you're used to going to. That is when we might think that things are starting to go wrong. This ability to find ourselves around, to find our way around the world is really complex. And so I need to introduce you to a few other things first. So we're gonna have a look at a number of things. We're gonna have a quick talk about balance, how we stay upright. Mention dizziness, because that's always coming into things. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about cognition and how that affects everything we do. And finally, try to bring all of that together to understand this issue of how we actually find our way around in the world. So balance, it's a beautiful thing. 
It's really easy, right? Until it goes wrong. We barely notice it until we can't do it easily. And then it's, we can't help but notice it. It's the art of not falling over. And this is where the whole story for me really begins. It begins in looking at balance and thinking about what is balance. We use a number of things to help keep us upright. We use vision, a lot of information from our eyes about where we are in space, about what's upright, about where the ground is level. We use information from our feet on the ground and from the muscles as we slightly sway around those. Somatosensation, you might have heard of the word proprioception. Those things, that information from our muscles, joints, going to our brain. And we also use our inner ear, our vestibular system. It's like a sensor of gravity, it tells us where gravity is tells us where our head is in space. And all of that information goes to our brain and gets integrated and made sense of in the brain. I call balance the super function. It's really the thing that makes us operate. We can't stand up without balance. We can't walk without balance. We can't even sit without balance. And look at, look at what I'm doing. I'm so skilled, I'm walking. Backwards, talking, in front of people, it's amazing. And I'm doing that without having to think about it. And we do it all the time without having to think about it until something starts going wrong. We occasionally have blips in our super function. We have falls. About a third of adults over the age of 65 will have a fall in any one year a third of adults who might fall. And once you're 80, it goes up to about 50% of adults over the age of 80 will have a fall in any one year. These are massive statistics, it's a big problem. So what happens to these important senses as we get older? It's a little bit distressing, really. We all know that as we get older, we need longer arms <laughs> to try and focus. Our vision gets worse. But actually, so does our somatosensation. So does the information from our feet on the ground. That also gets a little bit worse. So does our vestibular system. It gets less efficient. We might start to feel a little bit dizzy, especially when we move our head. Some new research is indicating that actually hearing is also involved. That as we lose hearing, it impacts our balance. So all these senses are getting less accurate, less good at detecting where we are in space over time. So all of this sensory information takes a little bit of a battering with the years coming on, I'm afraid. So I really wanted to start to understand our patients. And patients were coming to our clinic, I work in a business and balance clinic, they were coming to our clinic and they were saying these sorts of things. I just can't pay attention, I can't focus for long enough. I forget where I parked the car, <laughs> do that all the time. My maths, it used to be good, but not so much now. Got lost on my way to work, again. All these things. Now, as a clinician, when you hear these things and you can't make sense of them, you shelve them. Instead of shelving them, I decided I'd go and have a look at the literature. What can I find out about these sorts of things? How can we make sense of them? So I went back to the library. It's one of my favorite places. And what we found in the literature is that there's this very strong link between vestibular dysfunction, dysfunction of the inner ear, and cognitive functions, those thinking types of functions. 
So it wasn't too surprising that my patients who had vestibular disorders were telling me things were going wrong with their thinking skills, with their attention, with their spatial memory, where am I in space, remembering where places are. And it was obvious in the literature that there was one area of the brain that was in particular greatly important, and that's this area called the hippocampus. Now, it doesn't look like a piece of metal chain. It looks like a seahorse. Hippo is Greek for horse. Campus is, um, campo is Greek for sea monster. Now, it's not very monstrous, is it? It's rather cute. This is what the hippocampus looks like and, and where it lies in a person. I don't know why the anatomists thought it looked like a seahorse, but anyway, <laughs> we'll let them have their way. It sits deep in the brain, it's in the temporal lobe, and we've got two of them, one on either side. And they're very important for spatial memory, for memory in general, and for finding our way around for spatial navigation. So at last we're getting to spatial navigation, having done balance and vestibular disorders. But this is how I arrived at this area of research. Okay, I'm gonna introduce you to three amazing neuroscientists. John O'Keefe, Maybrit Moser, and Edward Moser. Now, in 2014, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology. They discovered some specialized cells in the hippocampus and surrounding areas that acted like a GPS system. That's pretty cool. So we all have this iPhone in our head with the Google Maps in it, telling us which way to go. And supporting that, there was some evidence coming about out in humans. So McGuire in 2000 and 2006 did this really interesting research where he took London taxi drivers and compared the size of their hippocampus using brain scanning techniques with the size of the hippocampus from um, bus drivers. Now what's the difference between a bus driver in London and a taxi driver in London? Any ideas? <coughs> The knowledge, right. So the taxi drivers have to learn how to get from Crouch End to Buckingham Palace without looking at a map. They have to learn the map. It takes a long time. They spend a lot of time driving around this whole place, learning the relationships of one place to another and they have a big hippocampus. So the hippocampus seems to be really important for spatial navigation, for finding our way around the world. So the London taxi drivers didn't start out life with a big hippocampus. It became larger as they trained. This is really reflective of the brain's ability to be plastic, to change, to demand. When we put in the right demand to the brain, we start to see changes in it. If we spend all day sitting in a chair, we also see changes in the brain, but they're not very good ones. So the brain is this remarkably plastic device, and it's plastic into old age, and in particular the hippocampus, still very plastic as we get older. It is good news. I'm trying to protect my hippocampus. So in our brains, we have this amazing ability to cognitively map places and spaces to find our way around. And the hippocampus is a really key part of the brain that helps us to do this. And there's this really nice strong link between the inner ear and this ability to find our way around. So it's not surprising then that my patients who come to me with dizziness also struggle with some of these cognitive deficits, can't find their way around all the time. So let's, assuming that the hippocampus is really important and knowing that in the taxi drivers, it was nice and big, what do we expect will happen in the people with vestibular disorders? What's their hippocampus gonna look like? Right, it should look smaller. Does it? Yes, it does. 
It does. And there's a lot of evidence, some of it from um, some great researchers in New Zealand, Paul Smith and Yuan Zhang from the University of Otago, and lots of it from overseas. So we do know that in people with vestibular disorders, they have difficulty with spatial navigation and they have smaller hippocampuses. Now, what's really interesting, as I kept reading around, was that the hippocampus volume was also smaller in people with mild cognitive impairment. And I guess that shouldn't be too surprising either because what are some of the early symptoms of mild cognitive impairment? An inability to find your way around in space. So we're seeing these commonalities between two very different conditions, vestibular disorders and mild cognitive impairment, with a common symptom of difficulty in navigating the world. And this difficulty is likely to be mediated by the hippocampus. All right, so now I'm really thinking, gosh, we've got a loss of hippocampal volume in both groups of patients. We hear reports of spatial navigation, spatial memory problems across both groups. We see balance difficulties, more so in the vestibular patients, but you show me a patient with mild cognitive impairment whose balance is perfect doesn't happen. So I got to thinking, can we stimulate the vestibular system and influence the hippocampus in both these conditions? Can we improve the lot of people with vestibular disorders as well as those with mild cognitive impairment by stimulating the hippocampus? Or how do we stimulate the hippocampus? Can't exactly get at it very easily. It's a bit deep in the brain. The animal researchers don't have a problem, but none of my patients were willing to give <laughs> ethics approval for investigating their hippocampi. So what we do is we try to electrically stimulate the vestibular nerve. From the vestibular nerve, the information flows to the hippocampus. So we're indirectly stimulating the hippocampus via the vestibular system. So we um, are currently trialing in an, a couple of projects using what's called, and you don't need to be worried about this title, noisy galvanic vestibular stimulation. It's a beautiful <laughs> title. So the important thing about this is that it is subsensory threshold. You can't feel it. We put it on with two electrodes, one behind the mastoid process on each ear. And we put in a very small electrical signal that stimulates the vestibular nerve. And that information goes up to the hippocampus. Now, the device that we use is already accessible. You can buy it. Uh, you can only buy it from the States at the moment, but never mind. It's about the size of a mobile phone, so it's portable. And it's reasonably inexpensive. This is all the pathways that go from the vestibular system up to the hippocampus. And all you need to know from this is there are lots of them. There are multiple ways of getting there. So in effect, we're blasting this system with a bit of electricity and sending the electricity up any of these pathways. We don't quite know where it's going, but it is getting to the hippocampus via one of these pathways, or all of them. This is um, a really nice image from Hitia's publication. And usually when I talk about this, that's what I do. <laughs> There's four different pathways. Keep it simple, four different ways. The point is that there's strong connections between the vestibular system and the hippocampus. Are you all with me? All budding neuroscientists at this time of night, I'm very impressed. So when we go back to the literature and say, can we actually train this thing called spatial navigation? 
Can we train somebody to be better at spatial memory? Well, the evidence is that yes, we can, and that these things seem to be uh, standing out. Well, we know that the taxi drivers done all their training, they've increased their volume, but really, can we all spend two, three years studying the London A to Z and driving around to get an improvement? Probably not. But there's some nice evidence that aerobic exercise. So this is exercising at a rate that raises the heart rate and makes you pant a little bit. There's evidence that aerobic exercise improves hippocampal volume in people with probable mild cognitive impairment. And there was a report um, recently that balance training can also improve spatial cognition. So the, the evidence appears to be that physical exercise can also improve spatial navigation. And that's good for me, because I'm interested in physical activity, not only for its benefits in spatial navigation and other things, but also for its general benefits. We hear all the time, physical activity and exercise is medicine. Everything, physical activity, do we got to do more? We got to stop sitting down so much. We're hearing it all the time. So I really like to try and use multiple approaches to improving our health. So I'm all for physical activity. So when you look at those publications about, yes, we can change spatial memory. One of my problems with them is that they use slightly strange measures of um, spatial navigation. They use pen and paper measures. Now, a problem with that, of course, is that you're not moving your head. So your vestibular system isn't very active. Questionnaires as a measure of spatial navigation. It's probably not going to be sensitive enough. So we needed a measure of spatial navigation that, that somehow involved movement of the person in space. And we felt that only when we got that would there be a true measure of spatial navigation. So our research kind of hit a bit of a roadblock at this point because we had no measure that was good enough. So we were stuck with this, how can we possibly measure spatial navigation in humans? So I went to the animal literature. Do you know what they do? They drop these little mice into this big tub of water. It's water that's got a white dye in it, so it's opaque. And there's a, there's a little um, platform in the water. So how we measure spatial navigation in mice is we have this big tub, we filled it with opaque water and we've got a platform in it. You drop a mouse in it and it swims, I'm gonna say like buggery and I've just said it, haven't I? It swims, <laughs> forgot we were being recorded, um, until it finds the platform. And then it stands on the platform and has a few breaths. You take it out, you drop it in again. Swims around and around, looking desperately for the platform finds it a little bit faster this time, has its rest. Take it out again, drop the poor little thing in again. And the more you do it, the faster the mouse finds the platform. It starts to learn where it is in space until finally a normal mouse can pretty much go straight to the platform irrespective of where you drop it into the water. It's a really lovely measure of spatial navigation abilities. And we know that um, Alzheimer's model mice cannot learn to find the platform. However, I did feel that the idea of dropping people in a big bucket of water <laughs> wasn't gonna go down well. So how could we replicate this kind of thing where people were moving but not having to swim for their life. When we look at the things that are available to us that we thought might be quite good, there was this thing called the Four Mountains Test, which I'll give you a little try at in a moment. Uh, there was also something called the Triangle Completion Test, which I'll also explain in a moment, and the Floor Maze Test. So these last two involve movement of the person. The top one doesn't. 
All right, let's have a look at this four mountains test. All right, what happens is you get presented with a picture that's got four peaks on it. Can you see the four peaks? All right. Your job is to think about how they're oriented in relation to each other. Because next, you're going to see four images. Only one of those is an image of those four peaks. But it's an image of those four peaks taken from a different angle, as if the photographer has now moved. Now, they cleverly play with the shadows as well. So you can't just remember where the shadows are falling. All right, so look at that for a moment. You get 15 seconds to study this image. You're looking at the relationships between the peaks. You all got it? You're happy you can identify that? All right, which one is it? It's hard, isn't it? Which one? Bottom right? Anyone else, any opinions? Top right? What about bottom left? Bottom left? Top left? Uh. Bottom right. It's quite hard, isn't it? It's quite a hard mental rotation task that does use some of those skills, but again, it hasn't got movement of the person in space. The triangle completion task. Um, so you can see here we've got a therapist holding onto the shoulders of a person. And what they do is to guide them. The person's got their eyes closed. They guide them through a triangle. So they walk from A to B, and then they turn them, and they walk them from B to C. Then they let go, and they say, right, now find your way back to the beginning. So the person then has to turn and walk the right distance back. And we measure the angular error and the distance error. And those two things are a measure of how well can you manipulate space in your mind, turn to the right angle and walk. Now, patients are really good at slightly opening their eyes part way through. <laughs> So we've st stuck ski goggles on them now that are painted black on the inside. And we've actually turned it into a virtual reality test. So there can be no cheating. Um, and this is one of our setups with uh, one of our students with virtual, a wireless virtual reality set up in it. Now, when you first step into this virtual reality, it looks like this. It's got some nice pictures on the wall. Of course, it's got sheep because this was made by somebody in Christchurch for us. <laughs> um, and you've got some clues about where you are in space. As soon as the test starts, all the cues about where you are in space disappear. And it feels like you're standing on a moon skate and you, ha you have no idea about orientation. Your task is to walk into these lovely glowing circles. It's a bit like beam me up, Scotty. Um, you walk into one of the circles and another circle will start to glow. You look round for it, you walk towards the second point. So this is the second point in the triangle. And then you walk to the, another point, the third point, second point. And then um, it, you don't get a glowing triangle, a glowing light for the third one. You have to find your way back to the start. And again, we measure the distance and angular errors. It's really disconcerting when you step into this environment and you have no cues about upright. So we're really interested to see how people are doing with that um, at the moment. Now, whilst we talk about VR, you know, you might think, oh, this is really, really expensive. Um, and, and certainly it is. Our current VR system, when we bought it, was over $3,000. But now you can buy it for under $1,000. And actually, you can buy, buy Google Cardboard Goggles for $20.
So we're trying to make a system that we can ultimately make very affordable and we can put rehabilitation um, exercises into this environment as well. So we're looking to measure this really good measure of a spatial navigation that has the potential to be used as an assessment and as a measure uh, of spatial navigation difficulty as well as a treatment. So where are we with our stimulation studies? We're partway through two trials, one trial in people with mild cognitive impairment and one trial in people with a moderate to high falls risk. I'm gonna show you some of the balanced tasks that people do. So people are receiving stimulation at the same time as balancing. Now, if you remember back, I showed you an article that said, balanced training can improve spatial navigation. A little bit. What we're trying to do is just, how can we super boost the effect? If we add in an electrical stimulation, do we make the effect bigger and better? So half of our group are receiving real stimulation. Half of the group are receiving sham stimulation. And of course, neither know because it's subsensory. You can't feel it. And so we're doing some quite high level balance tasks. If you can see here, the person's balancing on something that's round and they're balancing on their feet, just on their four feet. And I'll show you this video. So all of these surfaces are very wobbly, as you can see. Stopped it there because he fell off. <laughs> he didn't want me to show you the bit he fell off. Um, but this is the sort of balance training. This is at the end of his sessions. So uh, eight weeks of training, twice a week. There was certainly no way at the beginning that he could do this. So we're seeing big changes in balance. And we are also seeing some changes in spatial navigation abilities. I'd love to come back and talk to you when we have all the results for that though. We don't at the moment. So I hope that I've managed to lead you through this really complex maze of how we find our way around the world. And I hope I haven't lost you on the way. And I thank you for your attention. Yeah, there certainly is a correlation with your inner ear and seasickness. So uh, probably the predominant theory of why people get seasick or, or other motion sickness, car sickness, is that there's a mismatch between the visual information and your vestibular information. So um, we know that traveling in a car and reading a book is, is really dreadful for most people actually. And that's because your eyes are telling you that nothing's moving but your vestibular system is all over the place, particularly if you're on any sort of winding road. So what you've got there is a mismatch between the vestibular information that's coming in and the visual information. And your brain's getting a little bit confused about what's what, and that makes you feel sick, nauseous, a little bit dizzy, all goes horrible. How do you deal with, how do you deal with motion sickness? How do you deal with seasickness? You try to get your vision on something like the horizon that's, that's far away and is not giving you any false information. So you're still seeing the boat moving relative to the horizon. So your brain's going, yes, that's okay. I'm moving, I know I'm moving. And your vestibular system is saying, you're moving, you're moving and everything's matching. Okay, and your vision's on a distance. Is that why I feel measure when I drive? Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and one of the important things about the driver compared to the passenger is, all right, we're coming up to a left corner. What does the driver do? Anticipates, predicts, banks into the left corner. What does the passenger do? Sitting there looking at the scenery, just gets flung in the opposite direction through centrifugal force. So the passengers whip the other way. So now you've also got a mismatch in information. So when you're predicting and your head's going this way around the corner, everything again is matching. You're getting the right information into the vestibular system about where you are in space. 
But when you're the passenger and you're a bit lazy and you're not doing what you want, you go the other way, you're getting a mismatch of information. That's what makes you feel sick. So when you are the passenger, all you have to do is pretend you're the driver. <laughs> so you bank into every corner, or you just do your head like this. I'm, I get really motion sick, so when I'm in a car, I'm, I'm just doing this. It doesn't have to be a big movement, but just moving into the corners in the way the driver would, and that completely stops my motion sickness. I used to tell my boat crew when I was yachting to um, go below and close their eyes. Yeah, right. I don't know the word, but they used to say. Yeah. <laughs> that, it's a, well, th there's two really interesting points there. One is about closing your eyes. Let's just get rid of the visual information. It's a little bit better than having the wrong visual information. It's not quite as good as looking into the distance and having some peripheral visual information about the boats moving. But actually the timing, it's a really good point about the timing. Once you begin to feel sick, it is really hard to go backwards, yeah. So prevention is better than cure in terms of motion sickness. I absolutely recommend the head movement whilst you're driving if you're the passenger. Talking about closing the eyes, um, you close your eyes and you try to go the same way. You always go wondering why is that? Because you're more right in the head. Yeah, so this is a bit of a mystery. So when you, if you, have a lot of space, for example, so uh, this isn't enough space, but you just let people walk with closed eyes. They will generally veer in one direction. Everybody generally veers in the same direction. And it's not understood why everybody goes in the same direction. That there is the thought that it is related to the vestibular system function, but nobody can say why. Does it, does it go around the different hemispheres? The, is, is vestibular information different in the different hemispheres? Well, maybe. Maybe it's, the, it's, it's about the interpretation of spatial information in the different hemispheres that causes us to veer in one way or the other. Actually, if anybody wants to do their PhD, we could, we could look at this by taking some EEG measures and looking at brainwave activation in areas of the brain that are actually active when you do this. Sorry? It could be. It could be like the bath water. And so if we go into the other hemisphere, so the northern hemisphere, um, people should veer in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, they don't. <laughs> yeah. Nice. I have got a um, group of three who's been diagnosed with an ear disease, and she's gone for that sort of health for the last year. Then you were um, this and this and bouncing, but do you treat people with ear disease? Yes, we do. And actually, you're very lucky to have here tonight some local experts in vestibular rehabilitation <laughs> who operate uh, clinics here. In she's actually in Auckland. So she's oh, she's in Auckland. Confused. Fabulous. <laughs> Come and see us. <laughs> New Zealand Business and Balance Centre. <laughs> yeah. Many years is a really nasty, is a, it's a nasty condition. Um, and it, it significantly makes people feel dreadful. There's not a lot that we can do when somebody's having a, an attack of many years. So that acute phase where they're having an attack, it might last a day or two. But after that, when, when it's settled down a little bit, then we can start to try and make things a little bit better. So there's that and taking lots of a drug called beta histine are the two things that happen. Yeah. Uh, is there any other sort of practical ways that people can help themselves? Like, you know, <laughs> driving a little bit trick is something very simple. Like walking and uh, those sort of things that it's all useful, I would imagine, if it's got exercise. It? Yeah. Most things with exercise are going to be better than not exercising. Um, and if we're trying to particularly make the vestibular system work a bit harder, what we want to do is to stand on a compliant surface so that we don't have good information from those somatosensory and maybe close our eyes, then we've got no visual information. 
which means that our vestibular system has to work really hard. So that's one of the things that people in vestibular disorders clinics will do. If they're trying to improve how well you use your vestibular system in balance, they'll get you standing on a thick piece of foam where you can't feel the ground through it, get you to close your eyes. I should have brought my piece of foam with me. Um, but you, you'll feel quite an increase in sway if anybody increases their sway when they do that. But people who have a problem with their vestibular system increase their sway a lot and sometimes can't do it at all. And what people in vestibular disorders clinics will do is to try and work out which sense is not working very well. So they'll manipulate these different things and say, is it vestibular? Is it somatosensory? Is it visual? Is it a combination? Is it a couple of things? And, and they'll select out the best sorts of exercises for you and the difficulties that you're having. But generally, exercises, I say, every time you put on the kettle, stand on one leg. For as long as the kettle is boiling. And if you're feeling really brave, close your eyes. I don't know. <laughs> don't know. If you can do it for two minutes, you're a superstar. You're allowed to move your hands to start with, and then we're going to get you doing it like that. <laughs> the other thing to do is to have a go at standing either with your feet really close together or all on one foot when you're going up and down in a lift. Because going up and down in a lift stimulates a very different part of the system that isn't very often stimulated. It's part of the vestibular system. Um, called the saccule, which is, tells you about up and down. And actually, the saccule is thought to be the little bit of the vestibular system that's most involved in these spatial navigation problems. So if you are finding yourselves having difficulty with spatial memory, perhaps the best exercise for you to do is to find your local lift, go up and down in it, close your eyes, take your bit of foam in, stand on your bit of foam. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Smith, how are you? As a dental 77 year old, I find for the last 12 months when I climb stairs, I tend to, my shoulder tends to get one of the walls. Yeah. Is that, what's going on? Is that my brains or the muscles not working? It could be, it could be either. <laughs> Just go see, go see the physios. It, it can be, you can do that as an adaptive thing because your leg strength isn't what it used to be. Now I've just, um, I've just been talking to my team about this idea. This is slightly nutty, and I, I do wish this hadn't been on record, but never mind. You're not allowed to ever play this bit. So I've, st I've started talking about this idea called moving young. Because I've noticed that myself, I kind of sometimes get up and it's like, oh, and I hobble off. I think, God, I'm looking like my mother. <laughs> I have to stop this right now. So I've started this thing where I have to feel like I'm moving young. How did I move when I was 20? I want to move like that again. So I'm gonna ignore the little twinge in my hip and the little ache in my calf muscle, and I'm gonna move young. Absolutely no evidence to this. <laughs> Completely unscientific, never replay this back ever. But it's this whole idea that we actually, we start to change the way in which we move and then we learn to move like that. And maybe we need to remember how we used to move and try to replicate that. Maybe, you know, in a few years time when I've actually got a PhD student doing the Moving Young project. We'll let you know how it's gone. <laughs> Hip replacements. They work wonders. Have you tried any experiments with the person who's Chi? Yes. I actually ran the largest Chi Chi trial that there's been with 684 people across the whole of New Zealand where we looked at does um, participating in Tai Chi once a week or twice a week reduce falls 
And yes, it does. It doesn't matter whether you do it once a week or twice a week. So I'd say do it once a week and spend the uh, rest of your time doing something more fun. Um, but reduce falls by 47% in people over the age of 65 who had a small to moderate falls risk. And ACC at the time were funding Tai Chi. Then the government changed. Everything went. Yeah. We were the envy of the world in our falls prevention work up until the government went from Labour to National when all the prevention, health pro uh, promotion and prevention work was slashed and burned. Yeah. So, yeah, Tai Chi is great. Yeah. As is yoga, as is dancing, anything where you're moving multiple things in multiple ways. We're not at the moment in these two trials, but we are um, now working with uh, Peter Thorne, Professor of Audiology at Auckland, and Grant Searchfield, who's also an audiologist at Auckland. And so we're really interested in this strong link between the hearing that's, that up till now has really been ignored. It's just starting to come out that, that those hearing things are important. Um, one of the ideas is, you know, in a hearing aid, perhaps you can have stimulation in, within the hearing aid. Yes. 